welcome all to uh, our uh, penultimate Brownback seminar um, of the semester. Uh, I'm very glad that Nicolina Zidek is joining us. She's an adjunct professor at the IE University in Madrid. She's been, uh, she's also a visiting fellow at the center, although a virtual visiting fellow due to the circumstances. She's been um, conducting her research and spent considerable period of time in uh, Argentina and in Spain um, and working on um, and working with the uh, Croatian diaspora. So today she's going to be presenting part of her research, which is uh, looking at the post-Second World War Croatian diaspora in Argentina and uh, their yeah, politics of memory. So uh, Nicolina, thank you so much for joining us and uh, looking forward to the presentation. Just as a last reminder to everybody, please keep your camera and microphones turned off uh, during the presentation. Uh, afterwards, there will be a question and answer session and you're very welcome if I call upon you to, uh, add, to ask your questions um, and please just announce it by either raising your hand option or by uh, writing in the chat. So Nicolina, okay, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll also hide my the screen so that I don't see anything but the, but the, um, the screen. Uh, so uh, this is a part, this is a book project that I was supposed to work on during my fellowship in, in Graz, but now I'm working on it from, uh, from Zagreb, from Croatia. Uh, it is also part of uh, an ongoing research, of a broad ongoing research on um, Croatian post-Second World War diaspora in the Spanish-speaking countries, uh, namely, uh, well, Latin America and, uh, and Spain. So I have already presented some of the parts and published them as, uh, as articles in memory studies and in the volume on uh, Framing the Nation that was edited by Vieran Palakovic and Daur Paukovic and published by Routledge on their commemoration. Uh, practices and uh, there are other, other articles on the Camp Fermo and on Generation 1.5 that are forthcoming or in the process of review. So without further ado, I would only say that I, <clears throat> I am uh, uh, studying them from the perspective of, um, uh, of, of, of memory studies and their tools of, ident of identity preservation and memory transmission among generations. I wouldn't go too much into detail regarding the theoretical background. Is any, if anyone is, um, is interested, I would be more than happy to share it in the Q&As, but now I don't think that it's really necessary. I would try, like to um, present the, the results of my research. I would just say that I did a qualitative methodology, uh, meaning this course and narrative analysis through personal attendance and commemorations by studying their written photographic and audiovisual material, meaning uh, their social networks, but also from the first generations. I studied their journals, the books um, that were published by the by the members of the community and um, and also the some of their public speeches. And I also gathered personal testimonies through semi-structured interviews with the generations 1.5, second and third generation. And I researched the archives from four countries for this research, meaning Croatia, Serbia, Argentina, and Uruguay. So um, since there is a lot of historiographical uh, material on the Second World War, I really didn't think that it was necessary to talk about that so I started uh, the research and started uh, my project from the time when they formed as a community. So with this means that the defeat in 1945, after they were defeated in the World Second World War, then the immediate post-war Bleiburg uh, killings, meaning when they surrendered at the Bleiburg camp in, in Austria, uh, and they were repatriated by the British Army to Yugoslavia, where they. Uh, they went back through Yugoslavia by death marches and they uh, were also target of extrajudicial executions. Then the next stop from them was Campo Fermo, which means that after those who escaped Yugoslavia and escaped Bleiburg uh, were uh, for the first three years were uh, refugees at camps throughout Italy, Austria and Germany. And the most important camp was Campo Fermo, which was an exclusively Croatian camp. Uh, in, in Italy near Ascoli Piceno and it marked the beginning of their exile and then I studied their final destination meaning Argentina where they came in 1947-1948. They were coming until 1951. It is estimated that around 17,000 of Croats entered Argentina in that period but only 10,000 um, remained in the country. So um, 
what is also very important, what I did is that I established five historical peri periods of their memory, which were affected by different factors, whether they're internal factors as a community or the external factors, meaning the local uh, circumstances in Argentina or the worldwide uh, circumstances or events. So in the first period, we can see that they uh, had to settle, they had to reunite, reunite families, uh, found, find uh, jobs, uh, learn the language, and also they had to elaborate their personal trauma, which was marked by the defeat, by the uh, Bleiburg uh, massacres or killings, and also by the refugee experience and the eventual um, exile. In, uh, this lasted more or less until 1960, then we could see that there is a shift in perspective because they already settled, they already accepted Argentina as their uh, at least temporary home and this is where they also well started uh, to shift perspective and it was also aided by the growing anti-communist sentiment in Latin America because as we know in 1959 the Cuban revolution uh, marked significantly the uh, the situation in Latin America and in mid 1970s is when the dictatorship in 1976 the last dictatorship in Argentina started and it lasted until 1983 which also marked them not that much the dictatorship in itself but more they were marked and affected by the, uh, the Falklands or Malvinas War. And also we could see that in 1980s, they also, um, the second generation comes into uh, the scenery and they also fusion their, uh, their parents and their, their own uh, memory initiatives and memory politics with the local ones and they appropriate the same slogans as the Argentinian local quest for memory and justice uh, is carried out at the same time. And then in 1990s, we can see that, uh, well, there's a significant shift because Croatia becomes independent. It's a dream come true for many of them. Uh, it marks um, a new period. Many of them go back to Croatia, meaning the first generation or go back to Croatia, those who are born in Argentina, but consider Croatia as their home. And this is when they think that they would um, that their memory and their truth would be acknowledged finally, but this is not the case and this is where also the disillusion and co disillusionment comes and it comes also hand in hand with the perishing of the first generation. So this is when the post-memory generation, meaning the second generation, takes over completely and fully all of the memory initiatives and they, ca they carry out the memory inter entrepreneurship as of 2000. So when we talk about this also, of course, logically, uh, the division of generation is also very important in this study. We have two first generations, which is the adults, those who came as adults, those who were the, really the protagonists of the Second World War, and then the children, those who came as children, and there is a difference in their memory. And then we have the two generations of those who were born in Argentina, but they still consider themselves as, Argent as Croats who were by chance born in Argentina because of the exile of their first generation of their, of their parents. And we can see also that these generations overlap, especially in the memory transmission and in the organization of commemorations. However, what is very important is to see that in the first period, it's the first generation that the, the entrepreneurs and the guardians of memory, but then already as of 1960s and 1970s and 80s, we, can, we have an overlapping of the second and the first generation, and as of 1990s, the third generation and uh, uh, is overtaking uh, the whole initiative. So, uh, as I said, I will just go through the main moments. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so the first and the year zero for them is, um, is the, uh, is Bleiburg, uh, which is the Bleiburg killings. Uh, this is the year zero for their foundational myth as, as a community. And it is very important for them. I will later talk about what it means, um, in the commemorations, but the Bleiburg uh, in general marks them as a community of victims. And this is the main, uh, point where they base their their identity as as a community and everything starts with Bleiburg and them being the victims of Yugoslav and British uh, politics. Uh, another thing is Campo Fermo, which also marked them as a community. They offer a pretty romanticized version of what happened at Campo Fermo. They, when you read their memories, you can see that they had a choir, they had a church, as you can see on this photo. Um, they had uh, masses, they had Boy Scouts, they had a choir, Yadran that was founded there and that's still active 
uh, nowadays in, Argent in Argentina, and it, that is a proof of them being a highly cultured and civilized community. They also had a theater company. They also had a football club, which was, of course, called Croatia. They started with their political uh, political activities and all of this is basically in line with the memory that they only wanted and longed free Croatia. However, when I read the materials from the Italian historians and uh, from other sources, it turned out they, they weren't there Pacific and only Croatian loving. They also uh, were involved in the attack on the headquarters of the Communist Party of Fermo. Uh, there was an attempt of rape of one of a local waitress, uh, which also caused the killing of one of the members of the camp. And also they, because it was extreme poverty and it is logical in the afterward period, they were also involved in alcohol, tobacco and opiate smuggling. And they even, um, they even forced their wives and, and daughters uh, to prostitute themselves to survive. But it, all of it, all of this is very logical if we think about the context and the times. However, none of this could be found in their in their memories. Then, when they came to Argentina, as I said, they organized their everyday life around the Croatian Catholic Center, which is still the center of their activities and their community. They organized Mala Škola, which is like small school, it's, it's kindergarten. They soon had these boarding schools uh, for girls and boys because their parents had to settle and had to work and couldn't take care of their children. Then we could see that the Croatian youth was also very well organized in clubs and uh, different activities. They would they dance traditional dances. They also joined the Yadran Choir, especially later. Uh, they were involved in theater company. They had regular parties, etc., etc. So we could see that it was a closed circle circle where they all lived. Uh, it was like a micro Croatian world. They, many of them worked at the textile industry that the owners and the entrepreneurs were Croats, mostly knitting factories. One of the most important one of them is Ivo Rojnica, who gave jobs to many Croats. And we could see that this also as a, as a, had an effect on the first generation, never uh, completely assimilating or integrating into the society and never really uh, learning the language properly. And also one of the basis of the preservation of the community were the endogamic marriages. So I will just go through some of the photos so that you can see them visually. This is from Miramar, which is, was a boys boarding school organized by the Franciscans. This is where we can see that they also had some colonies, that it was pretty happy childhood. Then this is the Cristo Rey in the, the outskirts of, in the outskirts of Buenos Aires. Uh, it was organized by the nuns of St. Vincent de Paul from Franco Pasca Street in Zagreb. So it was also a Croatian school. And then we could see that the Croatian youth was dancing traditional and accompanying every celebration uh, with traditional dances, uh, wearing traditional costumes. But they also gathered, they were also a close community of friends, so they would all only move inside the community. Um, also, we, they have a theater company. This is from Zlatarovo Zlato, a famous Shenoa novel. They also um, pe performed all other, other plays by Milan Begovic, Bestrecega, Hasan Aginica, Kula Fazlavica, and they also performed one, one Moliere's play. Uh, also, they were, uh, the, the adults founded this choir, um, Fer, um, Yadran that was really founded in 1947 as such and it still maintained its activity until today. This is the poster from the 70th anniversary in 2017 when they organized a big concert in Buenos Aires. So this is also transmitted from generation to generation to sing tradition, Croatian songs by Croatian composers etc etc. Yadran also would accompany every celebration of any every commemoration um, with their songs. So uh, endogamous marriages, it was also one of the main tools of the preservation of uh, the community. Every time that a Croatian couple would get married, they would uh, publish it in the, in the journals and they would also state the lineage of the family. So uh, you could see that they are, um, that they are daughters or sons of certain uh, military ranks or politicians and also they would stress their activity in the community. I think that will 
this is more than enough. Uh, and there, there are like tens of, of these pictures and you can see that it's celebrated that the, they're, uh, they're keeping and maintaining the lineage, the pure lineage of Croatian community. They're also involved in politics and this is very important in political activities. There were political parties that were accompanied by publishing, very prolific publishing. And what is very important is how they connected with Croatian diaspora communities all over the world. They're really very well connected. Uh, they had uh, branches of the same political parties all over the world. Uh, they communicated, organized uh, actions, etc., and they had uh, visits among themselves. Also, the relations with local authorities uh, are very important so that we could see why this community could be that active in Argentina. We know that uh, they came under the protection of Perón, Juan Domingo Perón, who gave them a lot of protection and this is one of the reasons why Ante Pavelic who lived in Argentina until 1957 was never extradited to Yugoslavia because he was under the official protection. However, when Peron was ousted in 1955 and there was an attempt of assassination against Pavelic in 1957, he eventually fled to, to Spain where he died in 1959. But in general, there were good relations with local authorities, especially since from 1930s to 1983, uh, there was a continuous cycle of dictatorships and uh, or authoritarian regimes and democracy, democratic regimes in Argentina and the democratic regimes never uh, got to finish their term completely and there was a coup d'etat. And all these military authoritarian regimes were anti-communist and the anti-communist alliances made them possible to be very active and be completely open about their activities and the, their policies. Um, in Argentina. Also, what is very important is their relations with Yugoslav Embassy, meaning how the Yugoslav Embassy and the Yugoslav Intelligence Services treated them and also how they treated uh, Yugoslav Embassy and uh, what was their interaction. So, when it comes to Croatian political parties, in Argentina, you can see that they were all Croatian, like the People's Front of Judea in, in uh, in Monty Python's Meaning of Life. So there was Croatian Liberation Movement, Hrvatske Oslobodila Kipokret, that was uh, Pavelic's uh, party that split after his death into Heferovci and Brančićevci. Then there is Croatian Republican Union, Republikanska Zajednica that later shifted their activities to Zagreb, and it's a party here in Croatia. Hrvatski Domovran that was founded in 1931 in Argentina, Državotvorna Stranka, State Building Party, and then we also have Demokratski odbor, Hrvatski narodni odbor that was um, Branimir Jelic from Germany um, branch and also narodni odbor that was Luburic um, faction. Also it was accompanied by publishing. These are the main, on the first journals, the first one is by Croatian Liberation Movement Hrvatska, Croatia. Then also Croatian Review, etc., etc. But there are more, much, uh, much more uh, journals that were published, however, we don't have enough time for that. I will only stress the main ones, Hrvatska Revia was uh, the mainstream, um, the most neutral one uh, that was founded in 1928 and it was active in Croatia until 1945. Then it was relaunched in Argentina in 1951 by Winko Nikolic and it was active in the emigration until 1991. It was in Argentina until 1965 and then Nikolic moved to Munich and eventually to Barcelona and this period is called Nikolic Revia. This uh, Hrvatska Revia is still active in, in Croatia. It's published by Matica Hrvatska. Then there is Hrvatski Narod and Hrvatska. These are the uh, Croatian liberation movement journals uh, that were very active and they were the memory entrepreneurs. And then in 1960, we have Studia Croatica, which was the first journal that was published in Spanish. So we can see that they shifted towards uh, the local community. One of the most important publications by, by Studia Croatica is La Tragedia de Blyburg, which was the first uh, book uh, on Blyburg published uh, in a foreign language with summaries in, in German, French and, and the English. Um, also, they were a target of, of, because of their political activities, they were a target of attacks <coughs> by the Yugoslav uh, intelligence services. This is a, one of the most famous uh, attack at Croatian home when the youth had their party and the three-year-old uh, Dinka Domacinovic, which is this uh, uh, child, uh, died. And it was also, while well, it served perfectly also, apart from being a, a crime, it served very well there. Community, their, their community narrative of being, as they say, victims of the barbarism of Yugoslav 
uh, Yugoslav communism. Um, this also gave way to, uh, to the youth becoming more active. We could see that uh, they, uh, they founded this Savez Hrvatska Mjedina Mladeži Svijeta, which is the World Union of Croatian uh, youth that started gathering uh, every year from 1961 well into 1970s in Montevideo, Uruguay and gathering a youth from Argentina, Latin America in general, uh, Venezuela, well, the United States, Canada, Germany, Australia, all over the world. So uh, they uh, practically realized that the first generation is not doing enough, that they're only publishing and they're only talking too much and they started to um, push for more revolutionary measures uh, and well, uh, ironically the revolutionary measures were imitated by the leftist revolutionary uh, movements. So uh, this is the list of the attacks on uh, Yugoslav embassy in Buenos Aires and uh, we could see that there were shots, fires, etc. and also uh, these are the repeated attacks against Yugoslavia. This is a list and a report from, from the Yugoslav embassy. So they're talking about destroying postal envoys, sending materials to our gender and press, and also holding lectures against Yugoslavia. The last attack was on Lazar Moisov in 1987, the rotating president of Yugoslavia who came to Argentina when he was about to lay the wreath on um, at the San Martin Square before the monument. Uh, the Croatian youth were sleeping on the trees the night before and then they got uh, down. One of them tried to attack uh, Moisov with a wooden stick and the others were carrying a uh, banner saying, as you can see, Yugoslavia is violating human rights, uh, freedom to <clears throat> political prisoners. Yugoslavia is the dungeon of the Croatian people. Croatian people have the right for the, to their independence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, also one of the main tools for them was were the commemorations, and we could see that they commemorate, commemorated, and still commemorate all of these dates. So they started with. 10th of April, which is the date of the foundation of the independent state of Croatia, 15th of May, which is Bleiburg Saint Anthony, which is 13th of June, which is um, the patron saint of Croatia. It is also uh, the day of the armed forces of the independent state of Croatia, and it is also uh, the saint of two main Antes in Croatian history, which is Ante Starcevic, which is the founding father of Croatia, and Ante Pavlic. And then in 1990s, we can see that they also incorporated the new homeland celebration, the National Day, the day of the fall of Vukovar, and the day of the Operation Storm, which liberated the territories of Croatia in the homeland war. So when it comes to Bleiburg, they, it has a very strong victimization mark. I will just go through some of the main points. We could see that in, in 1960s, they call it a tragedy, and it is something that was uh, the framing that was practically uh, relevant uh, until 2000 when the post-memory generation takes over when they start to talk about the genocide. Also one of the things which is very important is as I said the, the, the dictatorship didn't really bother them. We can see here in the 1970s that they had a commemoration of Bleiburg in 1979 with the orchestra of the Buenos Aires police uh, playing Croatian national anthem and we know that during the dictatorship the get public gatherings were banned so this means that they were really close to the dictatorship. Also in 1982 we can see that they hung a banner linking the Bleiburg uh, killings with the British imperialism in the Falklands war so meaning the local uh, the local uh, reality at that time. And also I, I saw this yesterday, and uh, the day uh, before yesterday, this is a new book, so we can see that they call it a genocide, and this is where they say they did it to those for, who died for loving Croatia, so this is what, according to them, what happened at Bleiburg, and they say that it was strictly, uh, it was done with the complicity of a part of the British military, it strictly silenced was strictly silent during Tito's decades and it is not studied uh, in schools either and it's an indispensable reading for those who love Croatia. Also yesterday they started the initiative, the petition uh, towards the Austrian parliament to in opposition to the resolution to ban library commemorations in Austria and I think that you and Graz know very well what happens there. So uh, they started commemorating 10th of April already in 1948 and they're still commemorating it until today and we could see that there are different framings according to the generation, the new generation, the third generation is calling it uh, 
the declaration of the first independence of Croatian state in the contemporary era. So this is how they are linking the end how with the Republic of Croatia saying that without end how without 10th of April and without the historical experience and the example of end today there would be no independent Republic of Croatia. So it's their merit and it's the continuation of the same struggle, the same with with the Homeland War. And when you ask them why they still keep commemorating 10th of April, then they say at first you celebrated 30th of May, now you change, then you change it into 25th of June. And this year we changed back to 30th of May. So until you agree when is your national day, we will keep on celebrating 10th of April as always. And this is also how we pay respect to our parents. When it comes to Homeland War and the Operation Storm, they call it the queen of all creation victories. And uh, they, they say that uh, uh, may all the creation fallen fighters of all creation times give, uh, that gave lives for creation independence and freedom rest in peace. So they link uh, the homeland war as a continuation of the struggle of their parents for an independent Croatia. And then they close the commemoration with ready for the homeland Zandom Spremni salutation. When it comes to Vukovar, uh, they use the slogan, uh, never forgive, never forget, which is curiously also uh, one of the slogans from the Holocaust, from Shoah, but it is also a very important slogan from um, Argentinian memory politics uh, regarding the civil di the military dictatorship. So we can see that they're always fusioning it with the local community reality. And finally, what is very important is what is that what I'm doing right now are the interviews with the so-called returned immigrants, which are the third generation who went to live to Croatia because they considered themselves Croats and because they were brought up to uh, go back to Croatia. And we could see that uh, there is a big difference between how they were brought up and how they uh, perceived Croatia as opposed to how Croatia is. And they changed their, uh, their perception of Croatia um, a lot. And finally, another thing which is a very important factor to think about when we I think about how identity is constructed. We still have uh, other Croats in in Argentina, which is the Yugoslav, the Yugoslav community. Uh, it's a small association, but also there are the so-called converted, those who were Yugoslavs during the Yugoslav times. And as of 1990s, they realized that they mostly came to uh, uh, to from Croatia, and they, they're in fact Croatian. So they started preserving only Croatian traditions. So. That is all. I think that I, I'm on time and thank you very much. If you have any additional questions apart from from now, I would um, I am giving you my email and I'll stop sharing the screen. Just let me see how. Yeah. Yes. OK, great. Um, thank you so much uh, for, your, for your presentation. Um, so, yes, we we open up uh, again for uh, comments, questions. So if you have any questions, please. Um, just make a quick note, raise your hand, or otherwise um, type in the chat box your, your specific question. Um, maybe just to start while everybody's uh, gathering their, uh, their thoughts, um, let me ask you, I mean, how is, how is the relationship of the post-World War II diaspora you've talked about with earlier diasporas? Because as you rightly said, I mean, as you said, there were multiple waves of migration to Argentina and Latin America from Croatia before. So how much were they linked? How much, I mean, you mentioned some of the publications which began before this wave. So how much, how was the kind of interlinkages between them in terms of also the, you know, you mentioned a lot of the kind of political activism of, you know, very much focused on a positive image of the NDH, kind of keeping that as a positive narrative. How does that link to the narrative which the early generations had? Did they were they co-opted, or did they resist or or reject this particular narrative? No, there was even no almost no initiative from this diaspora community to co-op them. They co didn't consider them as real Croats because they came as Yugoslavs or Austrians, and they were also peasants, so they didn't really have that much. Um, education to even know anything about politics and they consider that themselves Yugoslavs because they came with Yugoslav passports so they were not that active uh, it was the Yugoslav embassy that worked a lot with them uh, that also helped them publish their own newspapers you have a lot of uh, well uh, 
or, or earlier waves dias uh, immigration newspapers that were published that were supporting Yugoslavia and while well, the Yugoslav embassy also helped them a lot financially to support the other part. So, um, so the Croatian post-Second World War diaspora really didn't mingle, mix with them also because they were afraid that apart from those who were in the Hrvatski Domobran, um, uh, that was also very active in Uruguay, uh, curiously, because they, they were also afraid of uh, ha being spied on, etc. So they, they mainly maintained their close community. This is why, in, as of 1990s, when uh, the Croatian embassy also started to work to integrate uh, the earlier waves, and there was a strong resistance. Now they have something that we would call cohabitation, and they pretty much respect each other, but not that much. They that those who came after the Second World War and their descendants, they still think that those who came earlier are not real Croats. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, we have uh, two questions, one from Dragana and one from Gruya. So uh, Dragana, can you just activate mm -hmm. your screen and microphone so we yes. can see you? And then, uh, hi. Hi, 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 everybody. Hi, Nikolina. Hi, uh, hello from Oslo. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you for a really, really great presentation. I enjoyed it. And I have uh, two short questions. Okay. So one, uh, when it comes to this division of generations, mm -hmm. I'm just curious because I also operate with, uh, with the term 1.5 and find it very useful for some purposes, but tricky for others. So I'm just curious, uh, how, where is the cutoff for you between first and one and a half and then <laughs> one and a half and second, which is not really crucial for your analysis, but just kind of, I'm curious about it. Another thing uh, uh, is uh, what happened, like when you look at uh, and you interview third generation, what happened with uh, intermarriages? And uh, of course, I mean, I, I also was gonna ask about language acquisition, but at this point, of course, they, the Spanish is probably their dominant language, but how, what about their Croatian? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Uh, Nicolina, shall we have a few questions or do you want to answer them one by one? As you wish. For me, it's the same. Um, I think we can ask Gruya then for his question. He says that he's in a loud place. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So he will type. Okay. That's fine. Um, then we maybe get to Augustine uh, first to ask his question while Gruya is, uh, is typing. Okay. Augustine, you, you typed the question, but it's nice to also see the people, person who was asking the question. So if you don't mind to activate your camera and your um, microphone, then we can... Yeah, write. I could read this question. I think I heard that she said that they started using oh. revolutionary methods. Ah, yes. He's, he's here. He's here. It's good to see you. Yeah. Hi. And Johanna. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I was just spilled some coffee. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I, I think I, hi. But I think Nicolina already uh, read the question, right? Yeah. So yes, uh, they started, and also I can see that Matt and Nikola Tokic is here. Uh, so he's the one that really uh, he just published a book on the same, well, on 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 Croatian radical terrorism uh, and separatism, and uh, he really was, uh, but more he focused more on Australia, Germany, uh, West Germany, and and the U.S. And yes, uh, they. Uh, they used political violence um, uh, as a method, and it was more characteristic of the second second generation. Uh, yes, there was a tradition of, of, of terrorism uh, in Yugoslavia before World War II, but the second, and we know how Ustaše movement was created by all means, and their methods and the killing of the King Alexander, etc. But uh, the second, this is why the second generation wants to go back to the roots. So they mm -hmm. they draw from the ideas from the leftist movements in terms of methods, but they also draw from the like back to the origins. So mm -hmm. this is this is my point, and especially Mate, who wrote the whole book on that. So uh, I recommend you to read his book that was just, well, just published one month ago. Yeah, or two I, months ago. I, I think we can we can also maybe use. Uh, I think Jovana had uh, another question. No, no, no it was the same was thing the same about the uh, uh, Florian. Mm, so okay. yeah, but you you answered very well. Uh, <laughs> I, I if I I would uh, can, can I use my time just one second? I wanted to ask sure. you um, about. Uh, their ideological position, positionings, because I think we, uh, we, I mean, those of us who don't really know about the history of the community, we tend to have an idea that they were like a, you know, 
a homogenized, homogenized community that was all only like, you know, uh, bound by anti-communism and by conservatism. And my guess is that even if they had that national myth, they probably had a lot of internal divisions as well. And probably yes, as, as time went by, you even had people who were like, especially because of Argentina, you, in Argentina you can see nationalism coming from the left, nationalism coming from the right. So I, I guess there were some internal uh, divisions in terms of ideological uh, positionings. If, if you can tell us something about that. Yes, by all means. I mean, first of all, you can see that there were seven or eight parties that even Croatian liberation movement split after Pavelic died. So you can see that they had two uh, and the, the, the Vrančičevci are the ones that they were like the revolutionary movement of Hop and Sheferovci were more moderate. Then you have the Jelic uh, Hrvatski Narodni Odbor, so they were following this fraction, let alone the Odbor Luboric uh, movement that was more radical. So you can see uh, we cannot really put them all in the same basket, and especially Hrvatska Revija, which was the most more mainstream and more let's say intellectual and more moderate so they all had i mean this is also one one big part you have to really read all of their all of their programs and all of their uh, journals to understand how complex this was however at certain point in 1979 they closed the ranks altogether because they see that this fragmentation among themselves uh, is serving yugoslav politics against them so this is why they start they decide to close the rank and have a common action uh, uh, for abroad. Like we have the same goal, which is independent Croatia, and we should help people in Croatia to get this goal. There are still always uh, uh, differences, and but they're not a homogen homogen homogenous community. They're not all Ustashas. There are a lot of Seljačka Stranka members, etc., etc. So this is why we should not call them all Ustaška Migracija or think that they were all equally radical or 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 um, they had the same exactly the same ideology but the main yeah. the main objective which is anti-communist anti-yugoslav sentiment and nationalist sentiment and especially when it comes to Bleiburg this they were very united in commemoration so they could be different when it comes to their ideologies but when it came to commemorating 10th of April and Bleiburg there was no question about it so they were really, really united in commemoration. What happens is that the third generation, because they're not the protagonists, they don't remember what, they, what their grandparents who were the survivors, who were the ones who lived there, and I will go back to Dragana's question then, um, you could see that they don't know these differences, they have the same, they have a more homogenous narrative, monolithic narrative than their, par their grandparents, because their grandparents were there and they don't idealize the struggle of the, uh, they didn't idealize the struggle. If you could read, the first period is very interesting if you can read their debates and discussions. I mean, Rojnica hated Srljan who was at the uh, surrender. He was saying that he sold Croatia and there were a lot of people who were against Pavelic who said that he was, he would, he should step down. So you can see that the discussion was really, really um, heterogeneous. Um, so yeah. You know, one thing that just comes to my mind is, I think that something, a similar phenomenon can be seen of like homogenization of positionings in the second or third generation with regards, for example, to the Jewish community with, with regards yeah. to Zionism. When, yeah. you talk about, when you talk about Zionism with people that were born in the 1960s or 70s, they are much less aware of the many, many differences that inside the Zionist movement coexisted. Much less aware of that. There is a whole process of homogenization that is very similar in a way. Yeah, and also, well, there is a book in, in Argentina about dictatorship and Jews in the dictatorship, and it's called Memories That Lie a Bit, because they're also backwards, they're trying to polish it, that they were uh, also homogenous, etc., etc. So you can see that second and third generation always does this reframing and reconfiguration of memory. Thanks, thanks, Agustin, also to, for the questions. Yes. Uh, Gruyer's question is also there um, because not everybody might be able to read it. Right. I just want to kind of, he's asking about the invocations of human rights in the demonstrations and whether or not this was uh, matching to something which was going on in Argentinian society in terms of the transition from military dictatorship to, um, to democracy. Um, and then there's also a second question, which is about the transnational links to, um, to Chilean groups. Um, um, 
and I hope I've, I mean, of course, you can look at the, the questions in more detail. And I, I want to add, make sure maybe to Gloria's question a little bit is to which degree were were the were the diaspora communities also in, you know, in the in the political and environment in Argentina? I mean, to which degree were they, you know, participating in the different, um, you know, supporters of kind of Peronist politics or or that also in favor of democratization to a certain way was exclusively all of their political attention directed towards Yugoslavia or were there also you know agents in in Argentinian politics and did that also have an impact then on their on their larger engagement which is in a certain way a similar question to what what Gruya is asking well uh, well I would first like to go to back to Dragana's question because of she course. answered yeah, yeah. so regarding the generation I'm counting generation 1.5 in terms of their memory and how they uh, remember their exile, uh, because uh, those who were born in Croatia uh, and those until Fermo, and those who were also born in Fermo. So it's from 1932, 1934, those who I found still alive, uh, to 1947. Uh, and I made a series of interviews with them. And they're important because of, uh, we can see that when it comes to their childhood, they remember very well what happened and they have a different view on, on their childhood and the refugee experience than their parents. But when it comes to big political events, then they, the same as the second generation, they resort to their parents' uh, memories because uh, they were too young to, to remember what, what really happened. And then they just appropriate their uh, parents' memories as if they were, if it were their own. And when it comes to third generation, it is a fact that um, uh, they are not, uh, there are still marriages, endogamic marriages, even in the third generation, because they still have this, it's called DHKSS, Društvo Hrvatskih Katoličkih Srednjoškolaca i Sveučilištaraca, I dare a foreigner to pronounce that. Uh, so it's a, um, um, it's a, it's a youth community where they play, they, they, they play at the church orchestra, they, they dance, etc. And they still get married among themselves, but not necessarily, it's not an obligation. And all of those who are the descendants of the third generation, they still were, uh, speak perfect creation, especially because they have Mala Shkola still, and they have this Drushtvo. Uh, youth youth uh, association and also with Croatian foreign policy towards immigration they go to Croaticum they have a, a study they study in Croatia they study Croatian so they didn't they didn't uh, lose their links and even now with with uh, Facebook and all the, the um, all the social networks they are maintaining the identity and they are maintaining the language although there is a smaller community today of course we have to admit that and when it comes to Gruya's uh, question, yes, they they keep on talking about um, memory and justice. They seek memory justice. What is very interesting is that in Argentina, they seek truth, memory and justice. But Croatian community asks for memory justice because they have the truth. Then they talk, when they talk about um, uh, those who were killed at Bleiburg, uh, they talk about um, they talk about the disappeared, which is a native category in Argentina, which were the victims of the forced in disappearances during the civil military dictatorship. So this is why they are talking about the disappeared at Bleiburg. Uh, so we can see that they appropriate something that is very common, the native categories from. Argentina into their own memory uh, memory politics because it's also uh, it's, it's a way of um, uh, making them closer or uh, making them more familiar with uh, to, to the Argentinians of what they are fighting fighting for so this is why we can see that they're mixing and we could see also never forget never forgive this is also one of the slogans so they're constantly constantly uh, appropriating the local the local slogans and the local practices to their own practices. Um, and you asked me about the degree in political involvement is that uh, in the transitional links, not, no, not with Chileans, there were not a lot of political emigration in Chileans. Curiously, it's the same thing that happened with the German community. There was also German community in 1920s, beginning of the 20th century and when the 
um, um, uh, Nazi community tried to go to Chile, it wasn't accepted by the German community in Chile. So, uh, but there were in others, I mean, transnational links, they were with Peru, they were with Bolivia, there were some of them who went there, even in Paraguay and in, in Venezuela, of course. Um, and uh, when it, I, unfortunately, I don't think that I would be able to go and search for the archives in, in Venezuela for the objective reasons. And when it comes to the political environment, they were close to military dictatorship, as we could see. Uh, some of them were even ministers or vice ministers in Peron, first Peron's government. And they were always close with, with the government, but they were never really, really politically involved. We could see, for instance, that Peron's bodyguard who followed him to Spain, and then he, when he came back in 70s, was Milo Bogetic. He was he was uh, uh, he was from the Ustasha movement. Also, we could see that uh, he later accompanied Isabel Peron. We could see that Shakic also in 1990s he was bragging about having close relationships with Menem's uh, government, which is a fact because we know that um, Menem's Argentina sold us weapons. Uh, so we know that there were negotiations uh, with, the, uh, with breaking the, the embargo. This is what Menem was found guilty for, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see that they were close, but they were never very visible. And they were never really openly active in, in, in Argentinian politics because it was not their cause. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, we have uh, Matthias Figal who also wants to ask a question. So maybe we can uh, give him the chance to turn on the camera and the microphone and to ask you a question. Okay, uh -huh, here he is. Hello. Please, uh, yes. Hi. Hi, Matthias. Uh, ah, you can see me. Hello. Hi, Nicolina. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Uh, so um, I have a quick, a quick question regarding this um, use of the human rights vocabulary, which was very interesting. Uh, but this is one uh, very quick. Um, they only use this vocabulary, or they were also involved in the claims regarding the crimes committed by the dictatorship uh, as a community participation. And but my uh, my second question is uh, how how is the relationship between uh, between this uh, diaspora this organization and the official institutions of Croatia like the embassy and this kind of uh, stuff because uh, the narratives are uh, sometimes uh, conflicted, we can say. It's, it's, uh, it's not an official Croatian narrative what they are talking about in some way regarding labor and not all this. From the 90s to here, we, see, we, have, so, we have seen a lot of changes in Croatian institutional official uh, discourse regarding this. So I want to see what, what, uh, which is the relationship. Uh, you can mention, you know, the visit for, uh, of Colinda to Buenos Aires, and yes, the, these kind of things, which are really very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, when it comes to their use of, they're just using the vocabulary. Uh, I haven't found any disappeared, Croatian disappeared, or Croatian Montonero. For Firmenich wasn't a Croat. So, um, I suspect if we can see that the orchestra of the police who was torturing people during the dictatorship was playing the national anthem, uh, Croatian national anthem at their commemoration that they were very close to the dictatorship. So uh, maybe there are some Croats who are the perpetrators, but not the victims. Uh, I think that they told me there is one Croatian uh, victim, uh, but it, I mean, uh, he, I mean, who was a Croat, but he wasn't, uh, he wasn't, he's not of the core community. So they were, if there are some of them, and I know that they were in the police or they were in the military, um, they were, uh, they, they might be perpetrators, but not the, but not the victims. So they only appropriate uh, the vocabulary, they only appropriate the, 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 the slogans, but of course not the fight. For them, the Montoneros are, uh, and it's very curious because Montoneros were Peronist youth and they were Peronists because Peron let them in the country, but then uh, 
they they are more pro pro dictatorship uh, when it comes uh, to that. They're pro Peron in the in the terms of the first government is what Peron did for them, but not for the Peronist youth. And uh, and they're all anti Kirchner and anti Montoneros, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is how we can see that most well, certainly they only just use their vocabulary, but not not their cause. Um, when it comes to the relationship within diaspora and the uh, authorities and creation modern institutions, we know that there was a systematic uh, foreign policy towards immigration, and especially in the last um, in the last uh, period, we could see that there is this office for the for creations abroad that is giving them a lot of um, a lot of money for their activities. Uh, you could also see that um, well. I worked at the embassy, so I, as I said, I had to go to all of their activities. We also know that Croatian Parliament was um, uh, the sponsor of the Bleiburg commemorations for some time. So officially, Croatian officials or Croatian official representatives had to go to Bleiburg commemorations and listen to all the speeches. And also, always there is a problem when the national anthem is supposed to be sung because. Uh, those who come from the embassy sing one version of the anthem, and uh, those who come from the from the community sing the and the half version of the anthem, which is Savo Dravo Drimo Pet. So you always have this this problematic verse when we have to see who is going to be louder. Um, so it's uh, it's a very, I mean, it's creation politics. Uh, these are Croatian politics. So uh, basically, when it comes to the embassy, embassy tries to be as moderate as possible, or at least uh, not say anything to, in order not to get into conflict with them. But mostly, it never it never um, offers any resistance or contradicts them. The only thing that uh, the embassy officials have to watch out is to not to be taken any photos near any of the maps that they have there uh, hung all over the, the their communities where the Croatia is covering all of Bosnia and uh, coming until Drina and Zemun. So there is always this problem where you're going to get a photo and if there is uh, any Pavelic photo, etc. So you have to be careful with that. Or sometimes they even play with that so they take it off so that there wouldn't be any problems. It's like a tango, uh, basically. Uh, but uh, Croatia is not doing anything to change their perspective or their narrative. It's just playing along because of the votes, because we know who is in power and they get the votes from them. And when Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic went, we um, we know we know, visited. We know that her speech was written by Davor Stier, who is a returned immigrant, who uh, and then she was talking about freedom-loving Croats who had to uh, abandon their country and uh, settle in Argentina. So we can see that Hadeze is playing pretty well with their with uh, their narrative uh, for the sake of the votes. And we can also see in general that this is also mutually reinforcing with the revisionist historians. The revisionist historians uh, were visiting Argentina and got a lot of materials from them, especially when it comes to the revisionism of Yasenovac camp and the theory of the triple camp. Uh, also, uh, so everyone who wants to work uh, in line with their narrative is more than welcome there. So this is how they are um they are uh, mutually reinforcing uh themselves now in the third generation and they're the revisionist historians are confirming the narrative of the grandparents of those who are the current memory entrepreneurs mm -hmm. thanks we have i think time for one last question by uh, aida ibricic um aida mm -hmm. do you want to ask the question in person or um, again it's always nice to see more faces so yeah. If you're willing, Aida, to okay. uh, the, the changing perception. Well, yes. Uh, the thing is that they they realize that uh, Croatia is not what they their grandparents told them. That the reality is different. They they have to uh, they have to uh, live here. They have to work here. They see all the anomalies. One thing is what Hades promises them in terms of their them as a community. But the other thing is to see the structure problems. How the Hades rule. Uh, works in in Croatia and all the problems that they uh, encounter. So this is why they're more realistic towards uh, the situation in Croatia. Of course, um, almost none of them is a leftist. We don't really expect them to be. Uh, 
to become a, an SDP a fan. But yes, they do their their perception of of Croatia and, and what is good for Croatia uh, is much different from from those who don't live in, in Croatia because they 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 follow what is happening. They they mingle with other people. They they um, they exchange opinions and then they. Uh, they realize that it's not uh, how they think, mm. how their friends are exposed. Mm. I was also going to ask you, I mean, this is connected to that, is to which degree did, um, do the Croats in Argentina then also, cons I mean, is this kind of being Croat and this nationalism much more kind of this political, religious performance? Or are they also then, for example, listening to Thompson, consuming, you know, kind of Croatian culture, which is, which I mean, of the whole spectrum, but also the nationalist, let's say, Croatian cultural production, which is produced in Croatia, or is that not part of everyday life? Yeah, it is. I mean, Thompson is especially popular there uh, for the youth, because I think it's like the, this crisis of identity. If you're not that sure of your identity, then you have to go to these extremes. And this is what happens. Uh, you can see this, uh, them sharing Thompson uh, songs, uh, uh, adoring Thompson or looking at all well, they're mostly uh, they, they call themselves the, themselves the planetary Croats so you can see that they uh, because they're using now all the the modern uh, media uh, social networks so they say that uh, they are the ones that lived in in that we are the ones that who lived in a dictatorship and they lived in a democracy which is very contradictory and that they could share the experiences and they also well um, read Nevno HR, uh, Kamenyar.com, and they share these news. And you can see the sources that they resort to are uh, practically this, this uh, bias, where they're looking at the sources that would confirm their, uh, their narrative. And also, this is how they can feel special. How can you maintain a Croatian identity for 70 years? Only if you feel that you are the, a part, uh, still a part of a victim community that is not being acknowledged. So this is why you have to resort only to the sources that confirm this this identity, and this is why this um, this this identity is being perpetuated, but through another sources or through a different through different tools. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we've uh, last chance if anybody has a, a, a last question. Um, but I, I guess not. Um, but I think this was a very, very uh, fruitful and very uh, inspiring conversation and presentation. So uh, Nicolina, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, and um, also for everybody else, uh, this is, uh, we have one more uh, Brownback seminar. Uh, Adelina Stefan, who couldn't present last week due to electricity outages in Romania, will be presenting her uh, research on comparing tourism under dictatorship uh, Spain with uh, Romania uh, in two weeks' time. So on the 30th of June, the invitation will be sent out and is available also on our website. So thanks everybody for joining, for asking the question, and thanks Nicolina for presenting your research. Thank you very much, and thank you all for the question. It was for the questions. It was very interesting. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.